data analytics, it is going to be huge in the shift of how we yeah. have conversations. So I feel it's disruptive in a good way. I'm not one of those fear mongers that the app is taking off the world. No, I wrote that stuff. That's amazing. Hi, I'm Courtney Harmon, Director of Industry Relations at Crelate. This is the Full Desk Experiences Industry Spotlight Series. Thank you so much for joining me in person today. This is new. This is the Full Desk Experience podcast where we talk to staffing, recruiting, operations, people in recruiting and staffing in general, whether it's CEO, founder led um, operations leaders that are trying to improve their business. You, joining me today are the founder CEO of Improving, and you're a leading software consulting company with focuses on conscious capitalism. I'm super excited. I had the chance to work for your organization, so I know what you guys stand for. I love it. Um, And just, you really bring the aspect of scaling and growing talent operations. And I'm excited to dive into the strategies that you've implemented here at Improving. And I'm actually in the Dallas office with you today. So thank you for letting me come here and joining me in this today. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here as well. I love it. So tell me a little bit more about you, uh, how you got into the industry, how Improving's grown. Kind of give me the backstory of how you got to where you are today. Um, This is really my third job. So uh, at first I went into the intelligence um, industry through a large system integrator, worked there for about four and a half years. I came out of there, which is a long story, but ended up starting my own business with five other partners, a company at the time called Xpeed. We later, this was during the dot-com, we later sold about a year after starting it to a company called Valtech. Shortly after that, I became the CEO of their North American operations until 2006. And we we parted ways at that point, their decision, not mine, and started a company called Blue Ocean, which quickly merged with Improving. And here we are today. So tell me a little bit more about how big Improving is. I, I believe you can tell me if these numbers are wrong. 250 million in revenue, 1,500 employees. Uh, you've experienced remarkable growth since the Blue Ocean merger to Improving. Am I correct? That is correct. And that, uh, so 17 years of growth, either organic or through um, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, last year was actually one of our tougher years, but we still were able to grow by uh, a small amount, which is uh, sometimes those years are more rewarding. Maybe not as fun as the high growth years, but certainly more rewarding. I love that. What What do you think could contribute or any attributes to the driving success behind the organization? Yes, mergers, I understand that. But how have you navigated scaling this as you've looked holistically and continued to grow your operation? Culture continues to be a very central point of our organization. I know a lot of organizations claim that, but we've continue to try to adapt the culture, try to be uh, creative with the culture, but always putting it at the forefront of things that we are looking at and considering. Um, It's not just lip service. We have programs about building trust. It's just on what we call trust pod before this call, but we have a, a large program called Come Together where all of our offices come together once a month on a certain topic and we discuss it. We have education, we have events around that topic. Um, and and that becomes central to, to helping your organization grow. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody knows this, but I think that improving, while not perfect, we have plenty of things to improve upon, does a considerably better job than most organizations. I can say that with testament from working here. Um, talk to me a little bit more whenever we talk software consulting company. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I know as we're speaking to staffing and recruiting leaders, um, you guys do in-house solutions as well as find additional talent. Talk me through what that model looks like for you. So for us, I use three words, modern digital services. We're modern. We're focused. We're centered on more leading edge technologies, not necessarily bleeding edge. So the leading edge right now is, let's say, artificial intelligence. But we always have to work with systems. Sometimes they're more legacy, just given the nature of our work. But we're centered in the modern. Uh, Digital, we're software, not hardware. 
And then finally, uh, services. We're a services company. And unless the product is directly related, like our training products or things like that, to the services we provide, we don't do it. We're not a product company. So that's the type of organization uh, that we are. We are about um, 1,400 consultants, fifteen, a little over 1,500 total employees today. I know from being here and all of the panels that you're on that I see all over the place, conscious capitalism is really a core principle here at Improving. Can you share how this philosophy has really shaped your approach to the market, whether it's talent acquisition, development, retention in today's competitive market? Sure. Conscious capitalism sometimes can be confused with uh, stakeholder capitalism. You see some things such as ESG out there or CSRs. And and while a lot of those things are rooted in really good um, values, okay, uh, with conscious capitalism implemented a little differently. The, the model is one of more of inspire versus require. So we want to inspire people to do these things, not require people to do some of these things. Um, another big aspect of that is a longer term, really a longer term perspective. Okay. Not looking what we can do in the next six months only not the next 12 months, but being realistic about what we can do in the short term while having long-term vision. And in improving, we've always had long-term vision. We have a 10-year written vision at the company, which helps people understand who we are and where we're going. From a talent perspective, this allows employees to say, okay, I want to stay here. This is a vision that I can uh, be on board with, um, or maybe leave if it's not a vision they want to be um, part of. And the same thing with recruits. So this becomes very central, this long-term vision of where we're going, improving has the aspirations of being a challenger brand. What that means is we have no aspiration to sell to a Cognizant or to an IBM right now or, or other large organization like that. Most of our employees, if they wanted to work at these companies, would already work there. Mm -hmm. So this is the type of thing where that vision plays uh, into uh, the bigger picture. They know where we're going. Um, the other thing about conscious capitalism, and I just want to say this, is um, I, I fundamentally believe I'm a free market capitalist myself. I believe in the good that capitalism has done in this world. It does not mean that there are things that have gone, everything's gone right. There are things that have gone wrong. But the foundation that most of the affluence in the world is built upon is capitalism. And then out of that foundation, a lot of good things coming, whether it's social or environmental, as we learn from our mistakes and then continue to try to evolve. And this is what I believe conscious capitalism is about. It's about recognizing the great that um, capitalism has done for humanity without forgetting that it still has a long way to go. So you won't find us attacking capitalism here. We will be proponents of capitalism, but recognizing the things we need to make better about it. And not only do you lead that board, right? Are you you're one of the leaders of the fashion I, I am on the international board. Yes. And then uh, there are many people within all of the improving brands that are a part of this as well, correct? Right. Almost all the offices, if there's a local chapter, we have, it's thing. one of the things that we give time with our values. And uh, again, it's not just lip service. Uh, we give work time. And, and employees get credit for participating in these local chapter events or going to a conference or speaking on this subject as, as well. I love it. I think that's great. And it's built in, uh, you're right, not lip service. You're showing in actions how important that is to the organization. Let's talk about the economic landscape in today's world. You know, many companies are facing uncertain times, budget constraint. I've talked to organizations and staffing and recruiting that are down 15 to 30% year over year. Uh, talked to an economist two weeks ago, and he's like, well, it's been an overcorrection in the market. And there's just so many opinions on it. Talk to me how improving has adapted its, whether it's talent strategy, sales strategy, to really face the challenges while maintaining a strong workforce and really client services from your end. It has been a challenging time. And what I can in, can say is that 2021, 2022 was very similar to 1999 and 2000. Okay. It's the, I had uh, run a business during that time was running one and I see many of the same things for towards the end of 2022, right? Or at least the middle, 
it was extremely difficult to recruit talent, mm-hmm. good talent, extremely difficult. And um, uh, to the point where employees and improving were being made offers that, that our business model simply couldn't afford. And you don't blame the employee for potentially taking one of these offers that's 30% more, 40% more on a few occasions. But one thing with that we didn't do in our own model, which really helped us, is we also didn't subscribe to those 30 and 40% increases. We didn't try to. We we were or we're not going to counter at those rates. It didn't fit into our business model. And I think in the long run, this played out in our favor because while we did have to do some restructuring, it was de minimis and from an overall perspective, and it was true restructuring. What we have found today in, in today's market is we can recruit at prices, at, at salaries that were pre pandemic, not pre this period, but pre pandemic, and um, that we can do it in about half the time period that we were previously with fewer personnel. So the market has shifted significantly, still hard because we have to find the right talent that has the right culture fit, the right commitment to excellence, which is very important to us. But we find ourselves in a very different market, yeah. even with employees returning to, to improving that uh, we treated them with respect as they chose to potentially choose a different path. And as they come back, we treat them with respect as well. Did you guys internally have to make a shift? One of the common themes was, you know, sales wasn't knocking down our door. You know, we had to learn to go get on the streets again because people were reaching out to us for needs. Did you did you feel that same adjustment in, in the aspect of sales? Yes. And I'm very careful not necessarily to blame the sales organization. I think yeah. that's more on the executive leadership or management. Back in 2000, uh, the 2021 timeframe, early 2022, sales, the, the sales were coming in so quickly that if we were to have won every one of them, and we often did, uh, with the difficult recruiting environment, we couldn't fill them. So they were left unfulfilled. So you have a sales team then that may understandably go, why am I trying to close these deals? Why am I even working hard? And and at that point, it became a lot more order taking, making sure that the alignment is there for the customer, choosing a customer over one customer over the other um, at a time like this. And, and now this is reversed, mm-hmm. right? Uh, a more broadly, um, especially in the tech space, we've heard of these record tech layoffs. We find ourselves in a different scenario. And our sales professionals that for about 18 months, They had honed their skills on optimizing around client qualification, right, versus, let's say, lead generation, true business development. We're finding ourselves back to the basics. And that's that's an executive Mm -hmm. challenge, not necessarily one that uh, is entirely the sales professional's responsibility. I completely get that. Um, And I think it's, you know, this market never truly goes away or away from its original it's it ebbs and flows and it's just getting back to the thing that you need to make most important is it necessarily new logos for new clients but no maybe it's not maybe it's getting back in touch with those people that we've done business with in the past that we haven't gave the attention that they've deserved well and you mentioned a use the term new logos in 2023 we had a, a record churn on many. We, we saw more top 10 clients enter the top 10 and more top 10 clients leave the top 10 than ever we have in our 17-year wow. history. So um, uh, that was a big change. The other big change that we saw was we had more new logos than ever, really? more new ones by a considerable amount, about 30%. So we're seeing a shifting marking, uh, market dynamics that's uh, occurring. And these things tend to, based on my experience, stable out. You're seeing our own revenue stabilize, um, becoming more consistent. We're in a very slow growth mode right now. Um, But these things, that kind of tells you where you're at. You're getting a new foundation to where we will probably, and I think just overall our sector, probably start to broadly 
start growing again late in Q4 or uh, early in Q1 of next year. So you're seeing stabilization and slightly that. I, we actually, I had a discussion with someone else and talking PE firms and VC firms that they're starting to hand out money again. Like, it's like, okay, this is nice to see things move in a direction that they haven't been moving in the last. It is. And and a lot of businesses are having to adjust to new capital structures. There's a, um, uh, I would say the common person doesn't really understand some of the uh, impacts of these rate hikes out in businesses. Mm-hmm. We have tens of millions of dollars going out the door in interest that we didn't have to pay on the same amount of debt a, a year and a half ago. So significant increase, that's jobs, that's money that can be spent on capital projects and things like that, that instead is going to pay interest. Um, I don't say this begrudgingly, it's just the new environment. And maybe the new environment isn't going to see the rates come down. Maybe not, but what will happen is um, effective businesses will adjust to whatever business climate exists there, not try to go back to the old ways, but to adapt to whatever the new ways is. And, and I feel improving is one of those, well-positioned and stabilized, but I'm not going to say it's rock solid foundation. But it's definitely different than seven months ago. Obviously, with your organization, how many different offices do you have? Okay. And then, but you also have offices in Canada and Mexico. Correct. Um, How do you ensure consistent talent management practices, maintaining cohesive company culture across different regions and markets? That's a lot to try to keep consistent, to keep the improving way of doing things. There was more inconsistency a year and a half ago. We try to, as we try to mature the business and operationalize, getting the leaders from the different organizations together. And it's something we've really focused on in 2024 is the leaders of the recruiting, the leaders in our business development teams, both of those in particular, um, getting them together, coming to a common agreement. So as they go out to their own enterprises or regions, that there is a common language, a common approach, common understanding. In addition, in the last 18 months, we've actually added positions um, which create uh, a senior executive role in the corporate that's in charge of recruiting across the organization, one for sales across the organization, um, and, and making sure that um, we're consistent. Consistent is one of the main charges of those roles and positions. When it comes to consulting culture, we, we've we had a lot of programs and we have more of our attention focused there because it's more than 90% of our employees and we have tremendous programs. Everything from trust levels that I mentioned to the come together um, monthly programs to our company retreat. We've added something new called the Improving 100 and um, It's not just a president's club for sales professionals. It's sales, consulting, recruiting, administrative roles. So we've done traditionally better there. Mm -hmm. And these are broad company programs. So even though we're 1,500, it's one program across all 1,500 and all those cultural programs. And I think that's very important to getting consistency. Yeah. Now, with your business development and your recruiting you said you have one person that hires all of those people internally, right? Is that, did I understand what you said? Um, no, they don't necessarily hire, but they do help hire. They're okay. serving consistent. So for now, um, our senior vice president of sales will interview. Okay. But if it's in a local market, let's say Dallas, yeah, it's a uh, both of the senior vice president of sales and the local market president must say yes. Okay. Either says no. So it's a shared responsibility, but the common thing is that senior VP in both recruiting and in say, you might have a different market president, but you always have that same person level set. And I think that's important. Again, didn't really think of it that way, but having one person Mm -hmm. 
while they may not have 100% of the hire decision, they do ensure the consistency across all the organizations. And you do consulting within each of your offices. You have recruiting hubs within each of your offices and business development within each of your offices. There's a lot of people, whenever they get these larger organizations, they may have like one recruiting hub. I know you, I know based on being one of your recruiters that they're very well connected across the offices. So I'm just explaining that for our listeners. But that that is true. Each of our local offices, if they reach a certain size, a small shift now, Mm -hmm. if they reach a certain size and generating revenue, there's a dedicated recruiting executive in that office. And if they haven't reached that size, now they're supported by our central recruiting organization. Amazing. I love it. Um, Let's talk to me as a leader in software consulting and training industry. What emerging trends or disruptive technologies do you anticipate will shape the future of our industry with talent management, staffing, and recruiting space? Without a doubt, it's artificial intelligence. You've probably heard that several times now, but I'm going to speak with an anecdote here. Back in the late 90s, there was a shift from functional programming widely to object-oriented type programming. And at that time, there was an insatiable demand of getting Uh, people presenting, getting this information. It just, it really shifted things significantly. We are seeing the same thing for the first time with artificial intelligence. In our industry, I haven't seen it since that big of a paradox shift. Um, The closest might be cloud, okay? And uh, to that, but again, I'm going to say this is an entirely different way of thinking and approaching where the cloud was a different way of doing yeah. Not necessarily thinking. And um, and so we're seeing this. Uh, we have an executive artificial intelligence seminar that we make open to the public. One person, one of our executives ran that more than 30 times alone. We have never seen that much demand mm-hmm. in our 17-year history of this organization. I have to go back to the previous one, like I said, to see that big of a demand. How do you think it's going to change the technology industry and the space you play in today? Answer that more broadly. I think it's going to change things, okay. including I love it. every organization, every single one will need to know how it is using AI or they're going to fall behind as an organization. Yeah. Okay, every group or team will need to know how it will be using artificial intelligence. And every individual, like myself, like a recruiter, like a sales professional, will need to know how it's using AI tools. There are more than 4,000 engines out there or something that are, are, are productivity enhancers. Mm-hmm. And from a networking perspective, one of the neater ones I've seen hear about it in this uh, artificial intelligence um, seminar is your sales or your recruiting professionals. There's this tool that looks at all your contacts, in your contacts, in LinkedIn, and, and it goes out and it will suggest, based on its research, these are the 10 people that you should reach out to. And it's because it's this person's birthday. It's this person's related to this, and here's what's happening, right? This industry was happening. And it's amazing what it tells you to go now. That would take me eight to ten eight to ten hours to do myself and this can happen in a matter of minutes and then it becomes more productive more targeting more genuine and authentic mm-hmm. it's just that you have your personal AI assistant behind you reminding you which we can't keep all this information in our head why these people are important today that's just one so if you're not doing something yeah right Another one, I'll give another one in the service industry and you um, would be like your case studies and things like that. We have something called Echo that we built inside the company. So this is how our organization and our sales professionals can just, okay, what have we done, right? Uh, In a certain technology, in a certain industry, in a certain geography, and the AI will come back with the closest answers with three or four sentences of what we did for a client and what technologies. And this is at the fingertips of our sales mm-hmm. professionals now. Yeah. Right. It wasn't a year ago. Data analytics, it is going to be huge right. in the shift of how we yeah. have conversations. So I feel it's disruptive in a good way. I'm not one of those fear mongers of that the AI is taking over the world. No, I wrote that stuff. That's amazing. I, it has its place. 
Um, I look at it from a recruiter and sales perspective that I am waking up to more spam in my inbox. But how do you cut through the spam? How do you differentiate yourself? How do you continue to get to the human touch faster with the assistance of it? Absolutely. And all the speaking that you do as a recognized thought leader and really for your focus on culture. What advice would you offer to other leaders in our space in the talent industry or staffing professionals looking to navigate what's to come? whether it's the rest of 2024 uh, or into 2025, how are they going to position their organizations for long-term success and growth? Things you might be doing or things you're thinking of for the next three, six, nine, 12 months. Um, On an individual basis, I'd recommend a few things. Try to think long-term and then try to uh, suspend objectively some of your own self-orientation when it comes to choosing practices. Let's let's talk about um, for those companies that have an option to work in the office. Okay, let's say and, and ours is one. We don't have an official um, uh, policy around this, but we have offices throughout. Some people may want to work from home for the flexibility all the time and and claim that they're more productive all of the time. But the reality is, if you objectively look at this, that the blended model is really starting to, you get the mixture of working with people, the productivity sometimes of home, if you can manage your own distraction. Um, But the benefits of coming together in community actually makes you work and be more productive. So how do we take these longer-term perspectives that maybe isn't exactly what we ourselves would choose for ourselves all the time and, and align ourselves with with that. Yeah. Um, in today's market, you can differentiate by simply showing up, which is kind of an interesting concept that if you show up in person, you're different than a significant number of people. And how are other ways you might differentiate? So think about that, I would say, whether it's as a business or as an individual. It makes a difference. We used your office today um, for people from my office to fly in to come here. And just those days cultivate inspiration and camaraderie, and they build so much more. When's the last time you work together in person? Well, I don't count because I was with one of my teammates last week. (laughs) No, you do. But let's say. Yeah. But even if you're doing it one time yeah. with these colleagues, one time a month or one time every two weeks, um, you would be surprised how more connected you are to them, how better you work with them in general, uh, things like that, if, if you find a way. Now, everybody can't do that because everybody doesn't have an office. I would, Absolutely. Right. But um, if you find ways to do that, it can be. Great. It could be amazing for your organization. Curtis, thank you so much for sitting down to talk to me. I love talking to you, obviously, but your perspective on the industry and what's to come. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks again. Appreciate it.